we look now at the range of relationships as a whole in which the self-conscious individuality can be observed to stand towards its outer aspect, there will be one left which has still to be made an object for observation. In psychology, it is the external reality of things which is supposed to have its self-conscious counterpart in spirit and to make spirit intelligible. In physiognomy, on the other hand, spirit is supposed to be known in its own outer aspect, as in a being which is the utterance of spirit, the visible invisibi invisibility of its essence. There remains the further determination of the aspect of reality, that is, that the individuality expresses its essence in its immediate, firmly established, and purely existent actuality. This last relation is thus distinguished from the physiognomic by the fact that it is the speaking presence of the individual who, in expressing himself in action, at the same time it exhibits himself as inwardly reflecting and contemplating himself, an expression which is itself a movement, features in repose which are themselves essentially a mediated being. In the determination yet to be considered, however, the outer aspect is lastly a wholly immobile reality, which is not in its own self a speaking sign, but separated from self-conscious movement, presents itself on its own account, and is a mere thing. Hegel begins paragraph 323 by talking about a range of relationships as a whole, a number of, as I put it here, possible relationships. And what are these relationships between? He says, um, in which the self-conscious individuality can be observed to stand towards its outer aspect. So what we're talking about is the relationship between the inner of the individual, something that we've been exploring quite a lot. How is that related to the outer? As we've seen already in the previous paragraphs, there's more than one possible outer. So we can take, you know, for example, my face, my way of standing, even the, the clothes that I'm wearing, uh, any other sort of things like, you know, what I'm showing, an uh, angry face or happy face, all those sorts of things, as revelatory of what's going on inside. And if we're, if we're doing this in terms of lasting uh, dispositions, we could say. Um, we're talking about how I appear most of the time, particularly at unguarded moments where I'm not trying to conceal what is within me. That's the perspective that physiognomy is going to take, and Hegel is going to contrast against it, as you can see here on the board, what he is here calling a psychological perspective. We might think of this in terms of not just psychology, but also philosophy of action and ethics and moral philosophy. So what is the, the contrast that he lays out here? He says, in psychology, it's the external reality of things which is supposed to have its self-conscious counterpart in spirit and to make spirit intelligible. So that's, that's what we're talking about here. What takes the inner, which is where spirit is? And notice that he is talking here and has been now for several paragraphs about spirit, Geist. How is it expressing itself? He says, um, it, it, you know, the... the, the Individuality is supposed to have a self-conscious uh, counterpart in some way to, to spirit, right? And so what could that possibly be? Here he's talking about the outer. And the outer for the psychological way of looking at human beings, not just at things in general, but human beings, is going to have to take account of the fact that human beings are reflexive creatures. Spirit is something that is related to itself and can take on a variety of possible relations to itself. So he goes on and he contrasts this with physiognomy. He says in physiognomy, on the other hand, spirit is supposed to be known in its own outer aspect, right? So we're supposed to be able to know what's going on inside the person, not just at this moment, but, but throughout their life, by looking at the outer, the face, the you know, gesture, all, all those sorts of things. He says uh, it's outer aspect as in a being which is the utterance of spirit. So notice what's going on here. 
when we're doing physiognomy or when we're adopting this point of view in general, what we're after is spirit. And we're saying spirit is expressing itself, or in this case, uttering. You know, the word here for utterance is uh, spracha, which can mean language or, you know, an expression or, you know, utterance is, is just fine. So the outer is the utterance of spirit, but the outer is what we actually get to see. The outer is what we get to focus on. And by doing so, we think that we have, we can then sort of read back into the interior and make sense out of what, what the spiritual is, what the geistiga, what the mental is, what the interior is. So Hegel goes on and he says, um, spirit is supposed to be known in its own outer aspect, the visible invisibility of its essence. So what we've got here on this side is an invisible essence, a vasen, right? Essence is vasen, and it can't be seen. This is the intelligible, or, you know, I mean, if we want to adapt Kantian terminology, you know, the noumenal as opposed to the phenomenal, right? Uh, we don't necessarily have to go that far, but we've got an invisible essence here, and he says, there remains the further determination of the, the aspect of the reality, that the individuality expresses its essence and its immediate, firmly established, and purely existent actuality. That's not going to happen with this. That's going to happen with this psychological perspective. Instead, what we get is, he says, the physiognomic um, winds up being just a being, right? So we have invisible essence being read into, being collapsed into something that's external, which is just a visible being, a visible sein, right? Uh, Wesen sein. Not yet actuality, not yet something that is dynamic. So let's turn now to this psychological perspective. What can we say about that? What does Hegel have to say? So again, we're still dealing with the same thing, the interiority of the individual, which is supposed to be spirit, geist, mind, um, whatever it is that we want to read into it. Uh, this also includes sort of a fabric of relations with, with other beings, other human beings. And he goes on and he says, uh, reading back a little bit, um, so you know, in psychology, it's the external reality of things which is supposed to have its self-conscious counterpart in spirit and to make spirit intelligible. What does that mean? Well, we look at this external reality or external actuality and thereby we you know, read back, just as we were with this exterior here, uh, what is inside. But now there's a very big difference here. There's a self-conscious relation here. This is a, as Hegel pointed out earlier, this is kind of a mute or surd external uh, particular, right? It doesn't say anything. It, it just, it is what it is. It could be it just as well be a block of wood, right? You're walking around with a block of wood for your head and it's been carved in a certain way and there you go, right? With this, what is the external reality? What is being looked at? Well, we've talked about this a lot. It's going to be action and speech. So he goes on and he says, um, there remains the further determination of the aspect of reality, that is that the individuality expresses its essence in its immediate, firmly established, and purely existent actuality. That's, that's you know, the risk here. And then he says, um, this last relation is distinguished from the physiognomic. Why? So it's not as if we don't have you know, the individual revealing himself or herself in a, in a way that takes on determinacy that becomes completely actual. But the way in which it's done is no longer the lineaments of the face. The way it's done is through action and through speech. So he says, this last relation uh, is the speaking presence of the individual, 
who in expressing himself in action, action is expressive, action is significative, action is, as we've already seen in the, the previous paragraphs, a way of saying something without necessarily using language, but working in something that's even more uh, at the core of actuality. Language is a little bit removed from actuality, something that's at the core because it, it is working with what really is. So he goes on and he says, um, okay, the speaking presence of the, the individual. Now here, he says, at the same time exhibits himself as inwardly reflecting and contemplating himself. How? Well, what is it that language affords to us? Within language, I can use the word, as I just did already, I, or its counterpart, me, or mine or any of these other things. I can say you and mean something different from me. I can address myself in the second person. Oh, you, Greg, what are you thinking right now? Right? I can distance myself from myself. That is something possible in language, not possible for the bones of my face, and it's something that's implicit in action, but only truly becomes explicit for action through the mediation of speech. Right? So this is something that the inner being is originating. It's, it's, it's originating the action. It's also originating its own capacity for reflection and contemplation uh, by taking back in that action through what it has to say about it or what other people have to, have to say and what it thinks about that. This is to make it... Uh, significative of spirit in a way very different than the, the purely uh, arbitrary external that we've been looking at so far. So he says, um, this is an expression which is itself a movement, features and repose which are themselves essentially a mediated being. Mediation is going on here from what is coming out of the spiritual depth, if you like it, or the interiority of the individual. Um, something there is being used that's, that's become actual, that's become out there in the world is nevertheless something it can use to mediate its own relation to itself and to make sense of itself. So he says, um, in the determination yet to be considered, the outer aspect is lastly a wholly immobile reality, which is not in its own self a speaking sign, but separated from self-conscious movement, presents itself on its own account, and is a mere thing. This is a reversion back to this perspective of the physiognomic, the physiognomic can't offer us this reflexivity that the psychological perspective that focuses on action and its meaning or significance for the individual, for other individuals who can, can witness it, for the society as a whole, uh, by the fact that it can be taken into language, turned into a universal. All of that is missing here for the perspective of physiognomy. In the first place, in regard to the relation of the inner to this its outer, it seems clear that that relation must be grasped as a causal connection, since the relation of one being in itself to another being in itself, qua a necessary relation, is a causal connection. Paragraph 324 is, I mean, almost not a paragraph, it's so short, and it's, it's very straightforward. There's not that much to have to say about it. Um, you might wonder what the reference of it is. It, it's good to keep in mind that Hegel is still, you know, critiquing um, this, this pseudoscience of, of uh, physiognomy and then by implication phrenology and, and other similar pseudosciences. Here what he's talking about is the way in which the inner and the outer are related to each other, not in reality, but in the way in which that science is depicting things. So we've seen that the outer is treated as just a thing, right? It, it's something that is... Uh, 
uh, fairly static. You can, you can see exactly what is going on. You can start generalizing about it. Notice what I don't have on the board. He uses the term necessity here. That's in part because there really isn't any necessity involved in physiognomy. It just looks like there's necessity. This is part of Hegel's criticism. The other thing is that the inner is thereby also being treated in, in the same way. They're both being treated as being in itself on Sieg Zeyendiz, and Hegel is keen to show that the relation between the two things, the inner to the outer, if we conceive of them as both being being in itself must be what he's calling a causal connection, a causal zusammenhangs, you know, things that are sort of clung together uh, in, in, a, in a way that reflects causality. Why causality? Because we want to have some sort of necessity to what we're talking about. We want to be able to say, aha, that guy right there is like, you know, in the Lichtenberg example, that guy uh, seems like a nice guy, but look at his face, you can tell that he's a bad guy. He's probably going to steal from you because he's got that kind of a cast to his face or he's got those sort of uh, things on his head, right? And we're getting towards the, the bumps on the head pretty soon. But that's all that really is going on here in this passage. Hegel is setting up the pins here so he can knock them down. He's not saying that there actually is necessity involved. He's saying that there's the appearance of necessity and that it relies on this notion of there being a causal connection. So now in the, the paragraphs that follow, he is going to start exploring that. Is there really a causal connection or not? Now, for spiritual individuality to have an effect on the body, it must qua cause be itself corporeal. The corporeal element, however, in which it acts as cause is the organ, but the organ not of action against external reality, but of the internal action of the self-conscious being operating outwards only against its own body. It is not at once clear which organs these can be. If we were thinking only of organs in general, the organ for work as such would be quite obvious. Similarly, the organ of sex and so on. Organs of that sort, however, are to be considered as instruments or parts which spirit as one extreme possesses as a middle term against the other extreme, which is the external object. Here, however, is to be understood an organ in which the self-conscious individual, as an extreme, preserves himself for himself against his own corporeal actuality, which is opposed to him. The individuality at the same time not being turned to the outer world, but reflected in his action, and in which is an organ which the aspect of being is not a being for another. It is true that in the physiognomic relation, the organ is also considered as an existence reflected into itself and reviewing the action. But this being is an objective being, and the result of the physiognomic observation is this, that self-consciousness confronts this its actuality as something to which it is indifferent. This indifference vanishes in the fact that this very reflectedness into self is productive of an effect. Thereby that objective existence receives a necessary relation to it. But to act on that existence, the reflectedness into self must itself have a being, though not, strictly speaking, an objective being, and as such an organ it must be pointed out. Hegel begins paragraph 325 by saying something that might at first be very gratifying to materialist reductionists, that is, people who believe that everything is material and want to account for everything else, uh, whatever it is that we want to talk about, consciousness, spirit, uh, affections, whatever else we're, we're, we're going to go on and on about. They say, well, that it can all be reduced to the configurations of matter in some way. Hegel is saying here, very clearly, for spiritual individuality to have an effect on the body, it must qua cause be itself corporeal. Now that's an important thing to, to point out. In order for anything spiritual to be more than just some kind of airy, floaty, doesn't do anything sort of idea, and that's definitely not what Hegel wants of it here, 
it has to have some way to engage with the world of our bodily experience, not just our phenomenal experience, but our bodily experience where we run into things, where we exist through our bodies. You know, this is a great example of Hegel. Um, you know, he gets a bad rap as an idealist because they think, well, idealists say that there's no matter, or it's all just mind or something like that. No, Hegel thinks that there is matter and there is corporeality and there is a whole world of objective reality out there. But that's not the totality of everything. And in order to make sense of it, we need something that transcends that in some way. Now, Kant had talked about this quite a bit. Kant was, wasn't the only person, too. I mean, you can read you know, Kant engaging previous thinkers like Barclay, for example, who said spirit has to underlie what we see as, as matter. Kant reduced things down to the opposition between the noumenal and the phenomenal and was, in certain respects, unable to really get through that impasse. Hegel wants to burst through that impasse, and he's going to do it at a number of different points. Uh, and here is, in fact, one of them, to, you know, if you want to see it that way. So spiritual individuality must be corporeal in some respect. That doesn't mean that it's corporeal through and through. This isn't a materialist reductionism, right? To say that it has to be corporeal qua cause, insofar as it causally interacts with things, is not to say that it is, in its essence, entirely corporeal. But it is to say that it better find some way to connect up with this stuff. And, you know, it probably shouldn't be as it was in Descartes, say, just through the pineal gland being manipulated uh, around sort of almost like a joystick. You can find Descartes' discussions of this in his um, uh, uh, letters with Princess Elizabeth and in his Passions of the Soul, his last major work. Now, so we've got spiritual individuality, the, the interior of the person, right? And, and Hegel is now going to spell some things out for us. He's not yet going to get to the point where he identifies the, the organ that he's got in mind. That's going to happen in just a few paragraphs. But he is interested in talking in terms of organs. So he says, the corporeal element in which it acts as a cause is the organ. But what organ? Not the organ of action against external reality, but of the internal action of the self-conscious being operating outwards only against its own body. What organ, this is looking ahead of course, what organ do we possess that is not so much concerned with our interaction with the outside world as such, but rather guides the other parts of the body. So it's not digestion, for example. You must well, digestion, that's not about the outside world. You take things into yourself. Yeah, but you know, you're you're essentially, you know, digesting the world. I mean flies spit up their digestive juices and then lick it all up. And so we like take things and chew them up and put them down in our stomach and intestines and digest them and, and all that. But it's really the same same function, right? We're we're consuming the world, or at least a part of the world. Same thing with our hands, right? Oh, I'm grabbing something. Definitely the external world. So he goes on and he says, it's not clear which organs these can be. What organs have the internal action of the self-conscious being operating outwards only against its own body? What are the ones that essentially bear on the other organs? So he said, if we were thinking only of organs in general, the organ for work as such would be quite obvious. Right? This. Uh, similarly, the organ of sex, uh, you know, reproduction, uh, and so on. Now, here's the problem. It says, organs of that sort, however, are to be considered as instruments or parts which spirit, as one extreme, possesses as a middle term against the other extreme, which is the external object. So, these other organs that we're talking about here, the reproductive system, the system of musculature, the digestive system, um, whatever other systems we're talking about, they perform a mediating role. 
They are, I mean, an organ means tool in Greek. That's the word we get, you know, uh, organ from. And, um, you know, Hegel's talking about as a middle term here. So it's a, a tool or a mediation that allows us to act upon external reality, not just as a whole, but in, in terms of specific parts of it. I eat this food. Right? I chase down that uh, mastodon and, and try to kill it or maybe get killed as a result. I chip away at this, this piece of rock to make a flint spearhead. So those aren't going to work for us. Where are we going to find something that is mediating but in a different, more, you might say, circular or uh, cycloidal way? So he says, here, however were to be looking for an organ in which the self-conscious individual, as an extreme, preserves himself for himself against his own corporeal actuality, which is opposed to him. So what is the middle term there? It's another organ, but the, the opposition is between the individual, the spiritual part of the individual, the interiority, and all these other bodily organs which are an external action, they're part of the outer, they're the, the body, right? What mediates within the body between the spiritual individuality and the parts or organs or functions of the body? He says the individual is at the same time not being turned to the outer world, but reflected in his action. Now the action is something that is out there in the external world. This is something we've seen. It's not really action unless it goes out there and does something. But the, the, the external world can sometimes be one's own body. That's external too. I mean, you can't get away from it the way that you can your house or the chalkboard or books surrounding you. Even your clothes, right? You can get away from them if you want to. You can't get away from your own body. But it is external to you in a certain sense. So he goes on and he says, um, in which uh, is an organ in which the aspect of being is not a being for another. It's rather being for self. It's not just out there. We have the capacity to have a reflexive relation with ourselves. So he says, it's true that in the physiognomic relation, the organ is also considered as an existence reflected into itself and reviewing the action. But this being is an objective being. And the result of the physiognomic observation is that the self-consciousness confronts this, its actuality, as something to which it is indifferent. That's a problem with physiognomy as, as a science, as a discipline. We want to be able to take account of the fact that even when we engage in this sort of physiognomic stuff, and you tell somebody, hey, you've got the kind of face that makes you a thief or a poet, they actually care about it. And they, they, it produces something on their own part, a reorientation towards their own body. That is something that, you know, I mean, we, we, we can see, we can experience, we can, we can uh, tell happens. Um, but, you know, Hegel's providing us with a sort of analysis of that here. So he goes on and he says, um, this indifference, the indifference of not caring, vanishes in the fact that this very reflectiveness into self is productive of an effect. Notice what he's saying there. The mere fact that there is this reflection going on already produces an effect. It's not like an effect has to be waited for. It's, you know, to use a phrase that had a lot of currency back in the, you know, 90s and early 2000s in continental philosophy, always already. It's part of our, our constitutive way of being. Um, so there is some sort of corporeality by which we are able to you know, take stock of, at least partially, what's going on with the other organs, how they're expressing what it is that, that we're interested in, that we're doing, that we're trying to ward off, you know, all these different possibilities. So he goes on and he says, um, thereby that objective existence receives a necessary relation. But to act on that existence, the reflectedness into self, right, this 
this organ that's that's somehow mediating between the the individual individuality of the body must have a being, though not strictly speaking an objective being. And as such an organ, it must be pointed out. So there's a challenge. What organ are we talking about? What organ has this mediating and reflexive function? That's an open question at this point. 